Hey everyone, so in the uh, continued spirit of trying to come to you and give these presentations from the weirdest, uh, most obscure places possible, I'm uh, sitting poolside outside a hotel uh, somewhere along the east coast of Florida. Um, there, it's the perfect level of distractions. People are beating on stuff. There's two parrots fighting apparently in the tree above me and various ship horns as boats go by and stuff. So uh, I got kicked out of my hotel room. I had to give that up and I've got a late flight. So uh, this is the best I can do uh, for now. So with that being said, let's talk about the judiciary. <laughs> so uh, Article 3 of the Constitution deals specifically with the federal judiciary uh, and uh, basically says a couple things. Uh, it says that we need to create a f uh, federal judicial system uh, to decide on certain controversies and matters uh, explicitly detailed in the Constitution. So a couple of those conflicts between states. So if states are, you know, one state is suing another, uh, that's the federal court system that needs to be able to do that because obviously it would be biased if you allowed the state court system in either of those states to do that there. Uh, conflicts between citizens of different states, so that would go through the federal system. Conflicts between a state and a citizen of another state, and then conflicts between states and residents of a state and foreign nations or, uh, sorry, conflicts between states or residents of a state and foreign nations or citizens is um, you know, what I meant to say there. Um, so put simply, the federal judiciary handles matters when the U.S. Uh, is party uh, or when a state or local court would not have jurisdiction, such as in some of the cases that we just described. So uh, how is the federal judiciary organized? Well, it's really broken up into uh, three courts. Um, so at the very lowest level uh, is the district court system. So that's a court of we call it the court of original jurisdiction, meaning that uh, if a federal case is taken to the federal court system, this is the first place typically it will be heard. Um, above that, you have the court of appeals. Uh, and so this uh, this court has no original jurisdiction, meaning they generally can't hear new cases. There's a few caveats there. Um, they're generally only hearing appeals from uh, other uh, courts and um, uh, from other court decisions. And uh, and then finally, you've got the Supreme Court of the United States. You'll see it abbreviated SCOTUS here. Um, this is the Supreme Court of the land. This is the final court. So if you have an appeal and it makes its way up the process, this is the last court it would go to. Whatever uh, the Supreme Court decides is, is final, uh, unless a later Supreme Court comes around and um, you know overrules or, or changes the decision, which of course we saw this summer here. Um, you know, on uh, there are actually a few occasions where uh, the Supreme Court can be the, uh, the court of um, original jurisdiction. Um, typically, those are going to be cases where there's a matter that's critically important and it's very time sensitive, so it has, doesn't have time to go through um, the entire system uh, there. So sometimes the Supreme Court will take up those cases. Um, again, that's going to be something that's probably pretty widely, um, you know, sort of covered in the press and, and other things. So for the sake of um, explaining kind of how the different levels of the court system work, I'm, I'm going to take you through a 2021 court case, U.S. v. Cooley. Um, this one was kind of interesting. I think it was uh, sort of a good representation of sort of the different levels of the courts, and you could apply it to, um, you know, a, a case, a really unique case actually here that deals with um, the, uh, the power uh, and jurisdiction of, of tribes, of Native American tribes. Um, for a good portion of my career early on, was actually a consultant to a variety of casino chains, including Caesars. Uh, but in doing so, I worked on a lot of tribal casinos. So it's funny, I was actually on a tribal casino last night um, for a, uh, a social event tied to the conference that I'm at here. Um, so let's talk about this. So Joshua Cooley is the plaintiff, uh, or sorry, the uh, defendant in this case. Um, he was uh, not a Native American, uh, important distinction here. Um, he was parked along a highway in the Crow Reservation, which is located in southern Montana. Um, so the Crow Reservation is Native, uh, Native American land. Um, so there was this highway safety officer, uh, I think of him as a state trooper, James Saylor. Um, he was assigned, he was basically a police officer for the Crow tribe. Um, so he stopped, he sees Cooley pulled over, uh, immediately suspects, suspects a DUI. Um, you know, Cooley is, uh, you know, slurred speech, not very responsive. Um, and he also notices two weapons in Cooley's uh, front seat there. So, you know, things aren't going so well for him. Um, so citing safety concerns, Saylor had Cooley exit the vehicle um, and he performed a search of, uh, of the vehicle. So during that search, um, which he claims he had probable cause to, to do because of um, because of the uh, the weapons there, turned up drug paraphernalia and uh, methamphetamine. So, you know, again, things aren't you know going so well for Cooley here. So um, Cooley was questioned by uh, by the tribe and the tribal police force and then federal police were 
brought in uh, since he wasn't a tribal member. Um, he was actually indicted by a federal grand jury on uh, federal gun and drug charges. Um, during that process, Cooley made a motion to the district court, so that lowest level federal court, to basically suppress the drug evidence, arguing that um, a tribal police officer had no jurisdiction or power to essentially uh, search him uh, or arrest him. And so this um, sort of is established, and we'll talk about the role of precedent here shortly. Um, this is established in this basis that um, you know, basically tribal communities only have regulatory power over uh, non or over tribal members and so um, you know you me somebody else going through tribal land um, you know technically according to this uh, this precedent um, they should be able to to arrest or, or detain us here now this motion was first heard in the federal district court in Montana um, that's actually where uh, again where uh, the incident occurred you can see a picture of it uh, on, the, on the right there um, architecturally actually pretty pretty beautiful building um, the court uh, agreed in this case with Cooley and said that uh, basically the tribal officers violated his Fourth Amendment rights by not first checking to see if he was a tribal member before uh, searching him. Here, they're fighting again. So let's talk about the uh, district court system uh, in, in a little greater detail here. There are 94 federal district courts um, in the 50 U.S. states and then also some in the U.S. territories here. So in um, the state of North Carolina, we actually have three. We've got one in Raleigh one in Greensboro and uh, one in Charlotte. You can see the, the jurisdiction here. So federal court matters that originate in different parts of the state uh, are gonna end up in this uh, in one of these three courts in North Carolina. Um, there's a total of over 670 federal judges. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the appointment of federal judges and a lot of people realize that Supreme Court justices are, are appointed and confirmed by the Senate, but it's actually the same process for uh, federal judges even at the district court level. So like I said, there's only over 670 of them. Um, federal prosecutors in this Cooley case um, appealed uh, the district court's ruling to the next level court, the appellate court, um, which was the Ninth Circuit Court. So in doing so, um, they basically went to the appellate court and said, you know, we don't think the district court ruling in Montana was, was correct, and here's the reasons. So in these appellate court cases, you can't introduce new evidence, new witnesses, anything like that. Um, practically speaking, they're mostly uh, an exercise in writing, so you're making a, a written case. Um, for why this should be um, appealed uh, at, at the next level. Um, and then there's usually oral arguments as well. So you're defending the, the case that you've made there. Um, you know, typically the, you know, the plaintiff, or sorry, the defendant, um, or, or if it's a plaintiff, won't even actually be there. Uh, a lot of times it's just attorneys sort of arguing the, um, you know, the legality measures here. Uh, but the Court of Appeals actually agreed with the district court decision, arguing that precedent had been established that tribes had no sovereign authority to exercise criminal searches over non-Indians. So the government, in its appeal, uh, ended up losing its appeal here. So let's talk about uh, precedent a, a little bit more here. So this is the basis of the U.S. judicial system. It's actually a holdover from um, the British common law system, but it's the idea that, um, you know, uh, in Latin, stare decisis is the term that, that lawyers use, let the decision stand. Um, new rulings are based basically on previous rulings, and so it's just cumulative over time. Uh, and, and aggregates upon itself here. Um, so uh, as you're arguing, particularly matters of constitutionality, uh, but also in other matters, you're gonna be really referencing uh, or citing previous case law and decisions to justify uh, your side. Now, the Court of Appeals cannot examine, like I said, new evidence or testimony, it can only hear arguments related to the lower court's decision and why they uh, were wrong or, or the other side thinks that uh, they were correct here. Um, in the Cooley case here, you have the Court of Appeals uh, for the ninth, uh, uh, appellate district here, which is uh, actually located in San Francisco, is the one that heard it. So you can see on the map on the right there, um, North Carolina, our appellate court is actually located in Richmond, Virginia. We're in the fourth uh, circuit there. Um, the uh, Court of Appeals in San Francisco agreed with the lower court that the 1981 case of U.S. v. Montana found that Indian tribes cannot regulate. Uh, in, in that particular case, um, a non-tribal member was hunting or, or fishing, I think it was fishing, on um, land that was tribal land um, and he was uh, cited for that in some way shape or form uh, and the court ruled that that was um, basically unconstitutional because tribal authorities had no uh, jurisdiction uh, over him if you go to a tribal casino and you count cards or do something else shady I can guarantee you they're gonna exercise some regulation on you uh, quite quickly so uh, the Cooley case, um, the, the federal government, so they've twice lost, um, they decide to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. So federal prosecutors um, disagreed with the, the district court decision and also the appellate court, uh, and they made this final appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, 
when you make an appeal to the Supreme Court, very few cases are actually accepted by the court. Uh, there's a very high threshold as an attorney. Um, getting to argue for the Supreme Court is a pretty pretty big deal here. Um, again, the Supreme Court only has the power to review the decisions of the lower court uh, as argued by the federal prosecutor. So you basically, um, the federal prosecutors in this case had to make an argument for why they felt that the two courts had erred uh, in their decisions previously. Um, so in the particular case of Cooley, actually, what happened is that the Supreme Court actually reversed the decision of the two lower courts, which was bad news for Cooley. They found that Cooley's Fourth Amendment rights um, were not violated and ended up being a unanimous decision. So we have nine Supreme Court justices, which we'll talk about here in a second. All nine of them uh, sided with the federal prosecutor here. Um, if you want to know specifically why, they argued that the Montana case made an exception. So the, the precedent that had been established by that uh, previous case have made an exception for situations when the conduct of a non-Indian or non-tribal suspect actually threatens the safety of the tribe. Uh, prosecutors argued that uh, the firearms located um, you know, in clear sight in the vehicle constituted a threat to the tribe, and the Supreme Court agreed, and um, the uh, basically the drug charges stuck, uh, unfortunately, for Cooley. So I talked about this previously. Um, let's bring it up again. Let's talk about the selection of federal judges. So the president is given the constitutional authority to nominate all federal judges, including Supreme Court justices. Now, the president's selections have to be confirmed by the Senate, by a simple majority vote. Um, the selection of judges, um, you know, in, in most cases, uh, because there's so many federal judges, typically goes unnoticed. It doesn't get a lot of attention, um, maybe some attention in Congress, particularly if it's somebody that's associated with specific views. Um, you know, in practice, presidents tend to nominate judges that match their ideological positions or match their beliefs. Um, but at the same time, they have to ensure that these nominees can be voted on in the Senate. So if you're a Republican president, if you're, you know, Donald Trump um, and the Democrats have um, control over the Senate or was split uh, or, you know, had control of the split or Senate uh, for the time that they did, um, you know, you can, you know, if you try and nominate somebody who's an extreme right wing um, you know, judge or perceived that way, um, you're probably going to get pushed back by, you know, from the Senate, from the other party in the Senate. Um, and if all Democrats, if they have a majority and they decide to, to not to confirm this person, then uh, you have to come up with somebody else. Um, this is, uh, you know, long, but probably even more so recently become a very sort of contentious and um, you know, hotly debated issue um, as a strategy for influencing sort of the political culture of the United States. Um, increasingly, political parties are looking to this judicial nomination process um, to uh, sort of exert longer lasting influence. Now, when um, the Senate is controlled by the same political party, um, naturally you have a lot more power to get somebody across, but not in all cases. I mean, so you certainly have political moderates, um, you know, or those that um, are interested in a single issue that might, um, you know, for instance, you could have a pro-life Democrat um, who doesn't vote to confirm somebody who's, um, you know, ruled uh, in favor of abortion rights in the past, for instance. So it's not as sort of clear and simple as, as sometimes we would think. So let's look at the uh, current Supreme Court of the United States here. So it's comprised of nine justices. Um, one thing to note here, the Constitution doesn't say how many um, judges should be on the Supreme Court. Um, so it could actually be changed. Um, it's been discussed before. Um, you know, moving up from that nine, that's one thing that um, post the, um, the decision this summer to overturn Roe v. Wade that was sort of discussed, but, but not really. Um, if you look at uh, the presidents that uh, appointed each of these Supreme Court justices, uh, George H.W. Bush, the late George H.W. Bush uh, nominated, um, you know, one of those individuals, um, George W. Bush has two, Barack Obama two, uh, Donald Trump three. So that was probably the most lasting implication of the Donald Trump administration was that he had the opportunity to appoint um, three justices there. And then Joe Biden uh, has uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson, the most recent uh, addition there. So. Very important thing here. Um, like all federal judges, Supreme Court justices serve a life term. Uh, they generally only leave office uh, due to either retirement or death. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, recently uh, when, um, well, relatively recently when Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, passed, um, that gave uh, Donald Trump the opportunity to uh, appoint a new justice in their uh, place. Um, you know, when Anthony Kennedy retired from the court uh, last year, it was last year, um, that was what created the opening for Ketanji Brown Jackson. Um, so that's generally the two ways uh, that Supreme Court justices uh, are removed from the bench or federal justice in general. Um, the third way would be impeachment. Um, 
that has only happened uh, on a couple of occasions uh, in, the, in the judicial court system, but never for a Supreme Court justice. I don't believe. I believe it's always been lower level judges. Um, so again, that would be extremely rare. Okay, the Duck Series says, um, wait, the public can't fire a Supreme Court justice for unpopular opinions. That's not very democratic, is it? No. Um, and according to the founders, with good cause. So the framers of the Constitution saw the judiciary and its role as sort of being the, again, when we go back to Socrates and that uh, philosopher king, the justices were supposed to be the philosopher kings. Um, they didn't want federal judges to be... Um, susceptible to political pressures, political influence. They didn't want them to have to run for office and essentially make people happy. They wanted those judges to be able to focus uh, explicitly on the law, um, applying reason to it, and creating court decisions that were most consistent with the U.S. Constitution. So um, every time judges you know, issue an unpopular ruling, you get a certain segment of the U.S. population that um, you know, comes to the realization that these people are appointed for life. There's nothing we can do. There's no accountability. Uh, but the reason for that is that it serves as an additional check and balance um, against the other institutions, right? Because if, um, you know, for instance, look at the difference. Here's a good example. Look at the difference between, um, you know, police departments and sheriff offices, right? Uh, a police department is a, a, you know, essentially a job that somebody applies for and is hired for. Um, a sheriff is an elected official. Um, so the uh, you know sheriff has certain standards to keep their job or to maintain their influence um, that someone in the police wouldn't have. Uh, same thing between a politician and uh, a judicial appointee here. Um, you know the most recent I, I mentioned Kentaji Brown Jackson um, just to give sort of the example. When I put together these slides, I think it was after she had been nominated, but before she had been appointed. So I went back and edited these a bit. Um, get windy here. The tree doesn't follow me. Coconut. No coconuts here. Um, with the retirement of, uh, sorry, it wasn't Anthony Kennedy, it was Stephen Breyer, my mistake. Um, Joe Biden was tasked with nominating a replacement to the Supreme Court. Um, uh, Biden selected Ketanji Jackson. Um, you know, one of the interesting sort of side notes to that appointment is that um, he had explicitly said, I'm going to hire a minority woman. Um, that uh, ruffled some feathers for a lot of folks because they said, you know, you should hire the best or you should nominate the best, um, best potential candidate. We go back to that issue of uh, you know different types of substantive versus descriptive representation. Uh, Biden thought that um, you know there was a necessity to have an African American woman uh, on the court, and so that's the, the path he went. Um, Justice Jackson's uh, background, though, um, nobody disputed the fact that she was very well qualified, uh, at least relative to other potential candidates here. Um, she actually was a federal appellate judge at the time that she was nominated by Biden. She had actually been nominated to that position. Uh, by Barack Obama um, to, uh, you know, who actually she was nominated to the district court and then uh, was promoted to federal appellate. Um, so Harvard Law grad. In addition to that, she was editor of the Harvard Law Review. Uh, you'll remember Barack Obama was as well. That's a BFD. Um, that's essentially kind of the equivalent of valedictorian at Harvard Law School. Um, the Law Review is the publication that reviews cases, and if you're the editor of it, that means you you are one of the top law students at Harvard Law. Um, she also attended Harvard for undergrad, served as an attorney in private practice uh, after clerking for uh, uh, several federal judges. So she very much had a uh, distinguished career that uh, it made sense that she would be, be a candidate there. So um, she was forced to go before the Senate. Uh, and is, as is often the case, this gets a lot of publicity. Um, it's, it's often in the news and covered quite extensively. Um, so she faced a hearing with the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, again, this is a committee that uh, members of the Senate like to be on because it's one of the few committees that uh, a lot of Americans see the coverage there. So it gives you a lot of uh, attention. Um, she was asked a variety of questions pertaining to her personal and political beliefs as well as previous uh, rulings. Um, I think there were some that was an interesting one because there were some situations where she, were, she was asked questions related to gender identity. Um, that uh, I think she was prepared for, but again, it just didn't seem very relevant. And in some cases, it seemed like senators were just grandstanding to, to get attention. Um, so in this situation, if you know, if you had had all Democrats and independents vote to appoint her and all Republicans vote against it, uh, it would have been a 50-50 split because at the time the Senate was uh, split, um, actually 48 Democrats, but two um, individuals who caucus with the Democratic Party that are independents. Um, and in that case, it would have been left to the vice president, Kamala Harris, which we would expect probably would have uh, voted to confirm there. 
Um, in the end, what ended up happening, all Democrats and independents, those two independents voted to appoint Jackson. Uh, they were actually joined by three Republicans, leading to it ended up being a 53 to 47 vote uh, in favor of her, of her appointment. Uh, and when uh, the previous justice uh, officially retired, she uh, was placed on the bench. So um, let's talk about partisanship as it relates to this. So the president makes selecting ideologically aligned federal judges a critical element of the presidency. Um, you know, as we'll talk about um, when we talk about the presidency, um, one of the things that, that presidents are most concerned about is their legacy, because once you reach that point, you're not running for any additional offices. Um, one of the things that often outlives them is their Supreme Court uh, appointments here. Um, so generally, the presidents can choose someone who thinks like they do or if there's a certain issue that, that's aligned with them. Um, you know, presidents will often choose a moderate nominee when their party doesn't control the Senate or when the Senate is closely split. Um, and that's, again, to win favor among um, the more moderate members or members of the other party. Um, in the case of Kentonji uh, Brown Jackson, there was nothing to indicate, uh, you know, extreme partisan beliefs or ideology. And that's why a few Republicans uh, across the aisle to support her. Um, you know, but that being said, you know, we have a long history of federal judges that rule on matters uh, in ways that don't align with the expectations of, of the party or the president that nominated them. Again, once they're appointed, they're appointed for life, so they don't have to be accountable to anyone. A um, good example, uh, so the current Chief Justice John Roberts, he was nominated by George W. Bush uh, and appointed by a Republican Senate. So it was a case where you think you get a strong conservative and that's what they thought they were getting. He's actually been relatively moderate uh, in a lot of his positions. He's actually surprised a lot of um, experts uh, that write on the court with some of his rulings as being a little bit less conservative than I think the expectation was there. So, um, you know, this is a bit of a uh, interesting slide because it's somewhat dated here. So I had this slide where I talked about, you know, despite the fact that um, the, the partisan nature of the Supreme Court, um, the justices themselves have been known to generally get along pretty well and, and work together well. Um, you know, one of the best examples was um, Antonin, the late Antonin Scalia, um, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when they, they served on the court for a, a very long, for decades together. Um, ideologically as, as disparate as two people could become in their rulings, um, rarely ever agreed, were really good friends. They actually traveled extensively together. Um, I actually, as a high school senior, got to hear Ruth Bader Ginsburg speak at uh, SMU, Southern Methodist University, um, and she spoke uh, spoke to this specifically. Um, and I just thought it was really fascinating here. Um, historically, they don't involve themselves in political activities. and They try and steer clear of politics. That's... Um, been a little uh, tricky because Clarence Thomas's wife was heavily involved in the effort to try and keep uh, President Trump in power after the election. Um, but these lifetime appointments mean that um, you know justices have no pressure to adhere to any specific political position. Now, I put the asterisk here because um, as someone who reads uh, a lot on sort of the nature of the court, um, there has been a lot, a lot written recently to suggest that the court may not uh, be as collegial as it has in the past, that there's actually a lot of contention on the court. Um, the thing is, we don't get recordings of the things that are said in the court, and there's no there's no cameras inside there. Um, but what you do get are reporters um, who are observing it, who can write on it, and it's particularly those that have been there a long time that, that sort of understand the different um, relationships between the justices. And I think they're kind of um, uh, you know a little concerned that they're not getting, getting along as well. We're going to make your uh, code word parrot, by the way, P-A-R-R. -R two they may have flown off uh they were fighting it's pretty interesting parrot p-a-r-r-o-t again not even remotely related to anything important here but make parrot your code word so historically um you know most of the cases that are appealed to the supreme court don't actually get accepted by the court for hearing um you know although those with great activity uh among interest groups are more likely to do so so if it's getting a lot of attention it's if it's seen as particularly important um it's probably got a greater likelihood of being uh sort of taken on by the court um because the justices want to rule on matters that that are important to, to everyday people um attorneys present briefs describing their arguments in the case like i mentioned similar to the appellate system uh and the uh, court will also consider what are known as amicus curry briefs and that's latin for friend of the court um, so typically, you know, the, um, you know, the review of the Roe v. case, the, the Dobbs case from the summer that looked at abortion, um, had an extensive number of uh, amicus curry briefs um, from, you know, all the different sources that you would think, both, uh, you know, uh, pro-choice and, and pro-abortion rights, uh, or sorry, pro, uh, um, anti-abortion, pro-choice, pro um, 
both sides of them uh, submitted uh, considerable briefs. Um, the extent to which those actually do anything is, is up for debate. It, it could be that the judges, um, you know, have probably made up their decision previously or they don't consider them at all. Um, the U.S. is typically represented. So obviously the, the, um, uh, the Department of Justice is head, headed by the Attorney General, but uh, on the court side, in terms of litigating cases on behalf of the government, um, that falls to the U.S. Solicitor General. You can see our current one there. Um, uh, and she uh, would basically oversee all the attorneys, um, and you know, and she's also rocking those bangs, which I think is impressive. Um, you know, uh, but President Poor is uh, basically the head attorney, uh, basically under under the Attorney General uh, for the U.S. Here. Oops, sorry, I'll change slides here in a second. So what happens in the court? Well, or, oral arguments are made, um, similar to the the other uh, the other um, levels of the court. There, uh, you have the submission of briefs. The justices typically issue a ruling within the following weeks or months, uh, depending on the case. There, um, Supreme Court decisions are based on the independent votes of each justice, um, but uh, the ruling is based on the majority. Um, and so that's why the number nine or any odd number works out well, because you don't end up in a stalemate. Um, one justice is selected to draft the majority opinion that basically lays out the legal explanation for why the majority ruled the way they did. Um, if there's a, uh, a my minority member, so if the vote isn't nine to, nine to zero and there's a dissenting uh, justice, um, oftentimes, but not all the time, you'll see a, uh, a dissenting opinion who, which will lay out the arguments for why that justice or those justices ish, um, you know, basically disagreed with the decision of the majority there. Uh, as I mentioned, there are no cameras allowed in the court, so typically all we see are artistic renderings like, like the one you see here. In terms of how Supreme Court justices or federal judges in general behave, um, there's really sort of two classifications, and it largely depends on your perspective on the matter that they're um, essentially ruling on here. Um, there's one perspective, which is judicial activism, which claims that the courts take the approach uh, to where justices see their role as being acti active and championing causes on crucial matters, um, you know, dictating essentially uh, the direction of policy there on out, having more uh, control over Congress and that legislation. That's opposed to judicial restraint, which is this belief among some justices that their role is simply to decide on matters of constitutionality um, and that uh, matters of policy making should be left for the legislators. Uh, it's not, you know, as you might imagine, very cut and dry. Again, things that, uh, you know, for instance, uh, conservatives have, you know, for many decades argued that the uh, court was was exceptionally activist uh, in its rulings in, in over particularly on matters of civil rights and that type of legislation um, you know it flipped uh, during the summer when uh, Roe v Wade was overturned and now you had um, more, more progressive uh, yeah, members of the public and, and the media and, and whatnot arguing that um, you know the court was now activists uh, basically going the other uh, direction here um, so this has been a really fascinating time to study the court there's a lot of things um, you know the, the court and I, I was fortunate to be able to study under a guy who's one of the world's leading experts on the Supreme Court uh, you know for a bit a guy named Larry Baum and um, you know we had developed some pretty extensive theories and ideas of how the court worked and a lot of that's in his books um, I think a lot of that's been upended in the last two years, and there's a lot of questions about uh, whether those theories and models that we had actually still still work there. So that's the federal uh, judiciary system. Again, um, it serves as a check to the other two. Uh, you know, the fact that justices are appointed for life um, just creates a different situation. Um, again, and intrinsically, it's supposed to operate uh, on the basis of justice and what is right, independent of what any of us think. Um, and, and ideally, that that uh, would be the case there. Um, obviously, the rulings that come from the Supreme Court are extremely important, so that's why they tend to get a lot of attention. So, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, all the parrots are back. Again, parrot is your code word. Um, just provide that for me. Uh, thank you for staying with me through this whole thing. Uh, I've just got like four more hours to kill before I can get on my plane. Thanks, guys. Bye.